say hi to everyone who's joining us this afternoon. Please say hi in the comments. Let me know where you're watching. How are you all doing today? My name is Zoe Clark. I'm Self-Management Programme Officer here at NAS, and today I'm joined by Professor Carl Gaffney, who's Consultant Rheumatologist at the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital and also Chair of our Medical Advisory Board at NAS as well. Hi, Carl. Thanks so much for joining me today. Welcome, everyone. Looking forward to chatting to you. I know you're a busy man, so I really appreciate your time out today. And um, based on the number of questions we've had come in already, I think everyone's very excited to hear from you. That's good to hear. Wonderful. So, yeah, I can see we've got a few people joining us already, so that's wonderful. Um, so for anyone who's not seen the adverts running up to this session, today Carla's going to, going to be discussing different issues that axial spa can cause around the body that we call extra-articular manifestations. So he'll then go into a presentation and then we'll come back out and have a Q&A with everyone, go to all the questions that you've sent in already. So if you have any burning questions, please do pop them in the comments as we go through and we'll make sure that we cover them. So um, as always, our video will stay on the page afterwards, so you can catch up later on if you can't stay for the full session. And we'll also upload it onto our website on the My AS My Life page, where we have loads of resources to help you manage your axial spa. So Carl, I think we are good to go. I can see we've got a few people joining us already. So if you're happy to, I'll, I'll hand over to you for your presentation, then we'll come back and have a chat afterwards. Yeah, that's absolutely great, Zoe. So thank you very much, everyone. And I'm happy to answer your questions afterwards. Uh, so don't worry what the questions are about. I'll, I'll hopefully be able to feel them. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now with my slides. Got quite a few slides, but I'm going to run through them fairly quickly. So what I'm here to talk about today are extra articular manifestations, also known as extra skeletal manifestations. That means features of axial spa outside the skeleton. So. I think most of you will appreciate that axial SK is a very variable disease. No two patients are alike. We all have different symptoms and different parts of our bodies are affected at different time points. Most people with axial SPA will have spinal pain as their main problem. So that could be back, neck, hip, chest pain. About 40% of people will have arthritis in other areas, for example, in their hind foot, ankle, hips, knees, or have things like Achilles tendonitis, plantar fasciitis, or dactylitis, which is swollen digits. But then another big group, that's one in three people, have what we call extra articular or extra skeletal manifestations, which are features of the disease, that's features of AXPA outside the skeleton. So the topics that I'm going to discuss today are as follows. I'm going to tell you a little bit of what exactly an extra articular manifestation is and describe them. We're going to talk about why they're important, how common they are, why they occur. And I'm going to go through the common extra articular manifestations in a bit more detail. And finally, talk about the implications for choice of therapies, because with treatment, not all one treatment doesn't suit all. And we need to consider these manifestations, these extra articular manifestations when selecting the right treatment for an individual patient. So when we're talking about extra skeletal manifestations, we're not talking about arthritis, dactylitis, heel pain, chest wall pain, or anything like that, because that's all core part of the skeleton. What we're talking about are these three things in the top. Acute anterior uveitis, which is inflammation of the front chamber of the eye, psoriasis, and inflammatory bowel disease. By inflammatory bowel disease, I mean Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. I'm not talking about irritable bowel syndrome or celiac disease because they are not associated directly with axial SPA and they are not considered to be extra articular manifestations. There are two other very rare extra articular manifestations that I'll mention, which one is which is involvement of the aortic root. The aorta is the big vessel that leaves your heart and pumps blood through your body. And some people can have inflammation of the aorta, but it's exceedingly rare. So don't panic, don't be alarmed. And secondly, inflammation of the lung, which I must say I haven't seen in a newly diagnosed patient or an existing patient in the last 10 years. This is exceedingly rare, but typically affects the upper part of the lung and presents with chronic cough, breathlessness, etc. So why are extra articular manifestations important? Well, they're important because they're common. 
one in three people with back spa have at least one. Once you have it, you have it for life. They can come and go and vary in severity, but they're always there or lurking in the background. They can be the initial mode of presentation, meaning that sometimes patients with back spa present with these features first. So that could be bowel disease or uveitis and or psoriasis. So that might be the reason they go and see their doctor or the specialist rather than their skeletal manifestations, i.e. back pain, etc. The impact on the burden of the disease, so people who have extra articular manifestations have much higher symptom burden, meaning they've got a much higher load with the disease because they're having to cope with many other aspects of the disease as well as their skeletal features. And often that requires a team approach with management. So those of you who have extra articular manifestations, if they're complicated, may also be seeing a dermatologist, a gastroenterologist or an eye specialist, as well as a rheumatologist. Having an extra articular manifestation could offer a targeted referral or a, a referral strategy that could reduce the delay to diagnosis. So at NAS, we've got a big drive on at the moment called Back Pain Plus, whereby if a patient goes to a, an eye specialist with uveitis, we want eye, all eye specialists to ask about back pain. And if the patient has back pain, to refer the patient through to rheumatology. And that could potentially shorten the delay to diagnosis. These extra articular manifestations add a layer of complexity to the management because, as I said, when we're selecting treatments, it's not one size fits all. We need to target the treatment to the clinical features of that individual patient. And finally, they have implications for choice of therapy. This paper just is a nice one that looks at the burden of the disease, looking at symptom burden, pain, fatigue, and impairment of quality of life. And patients who have extra articular manifestations have a much higher symptom burden. When we look at the prevalence, that means the frequency of extra articular manifestations. For acute anterior uveitis, 25%, that is one in four patients with AXPA, will have uveitis at some stage in their life. It's often present when the diagnosis is first made, but 10 years later, the prevalence, that is the frequency of uveitis increases double. For psoriasis, it's about 10% or 9%, and for inflammatory bowel disease, it's about 7%. And once again, these features can emerge at any time point along the disease course. So you as patients and we as doctors need to be vigilant so that we pick these up and we offer appropriate treatment. Here's some data from the British Society for Rheumatology Biologics Register, which I'm involved with. And basically what this showed, and we looked at over 1600 patients in the study, and what we found that many patients had extra articular manifestations, as we already know, 23.5% had uveitis, 10% had psoriasis, and 10% had inflammatory bowel disease. But interestingly, the majority had only one extra articular manifestation. So one in three have one extra articular manifestation. You'd be very unlucky to have two, but one in 20 people with AXPA will have two. But it's extremely rare to have a full house of three extra articular manifestations. So if you have an extra articular manifestation, it's more than likely that you will only ever have one. Why do they occur? Well, we don't exactly no, but there are lots of factors. I think genetics play a role and people with B27 are more likely to develop uveitis than those who are B27 negative, for example. Mechanical factors are probably important. For example, in the lower part of the small, ball, small bowel where it enters the large bowel, that's a common point of mechanical stress. There's pressure where your feces, your poo moves through your bowel, and that's the common site for patients with Crohn's disease. But the same is true for the anterior chamber of the eye. That's a very uh, trigger point of pressure within the eyeball. And for some reason, inflammation seems to develop there in the anterior uveal tract. The gut microorganisms, that means the, the bacteria in your gut might have some influence on why you develop colitis. But then there are other immune pathways and tissue specific response path factors which are very complicated, but invariably they also play a role in why some people develop extra articular manifestations and why others don't. For example, psoriasis tends to affect pressure points. You, if those of you who have psoriasis will note that you often have it in your scalp or on the elbows or knees, which are pressure points in your body. So that seems to be a factor there as well. So I'm going to go through the extra articular manifestations in a bit more detail. Acute anterior uveitis is by far the most common, affecting one in four people with AXPA. The uveal tract is a 
portion of the eye, which includes the iris, the ciliary body. So it's basically extends right from the front to the back of the eye. But most patients will have inflammation if they get it in the front part of the eye, which is kind of fortunate because at least you'll develop symptoms and we know you've got it because you'll usually have pain and redness of the eye or blurred vision. But you can have uveitis affecting the intermediate portion of the uveal tract or indeed the posterior segment. But that's quite rare, but potentially more serious because that could be vision threatening. So for acute anterior uveitis, as I say, one in four people with AXPA will have this at some stage in their lives. It's usually unilateral, meaning one eye, but sometimes you can have both eyes affected at different time points. Over 50% of people will have recurrent episodes, meaning you'll have frequent or recurrent attacks, but the frequency and the severity varies widely. Uveitis is more common in men, and the likelihood of developing uveitis increases with the duration of your disease. In other words, the longer you have the disease, the more likely you are to actually develop uveitis. These features don't just happen simultaneously. They can be separate from flares of your spinal symptoms, etc. So with regard to symptoms of uveitis, if you have uveitis, you won't just sit at home and, and kind of think about it or wonder if you've got something in your eye. The pain will be extremely severe. You'll have a red eye and your vision will be affected temporarily in about 60% of cases, and you will have difficulty looking at bright lights. The attacks usually last for several days, but occasionally they can last for weeks. And if you have an attack of uveitis, it's almost certain that you will pitch up or want to go and see your GP or to an eye casualty department because of the severity of the symptoms. And ultimately you need to see an ophthalmologist, that's an eye specialist, to verify the diagnosis or to confirm the diagnosis because you need to have what's called a slit lamp examination of the anterior uveal tract. And you see here these little precipitates, these white blobs on a slit lamp examination. These are keratic precipitates, which are very typical of acute anterior uveitis. With regard to treatment of uveitis, most patients can easily be treated with drops, which will be steroid drops, usually and dilator drops. Occasionally, people will need high-dose tablet or injectable steroids, and very occasionally, they'll need immunosuppressant drugs like methotrexate, and very, very rarely might they need biologics. They may need biologics if the uveitis affects the back of the eye and the vision is threatened. But for patients who have been prescribed biologics for uveitis, these patients must be attending specialist centres, and there are a number of these designated around the country. For psoriasis, again, as I said, about one in 10 people with AXPA will have psoriasis. This is a typical picture of somebody with a psoriatic plaque, this red scaly rash that typically occurs on pressure points or exposed areas. And for those of you who have it, you'll, you'll see it's very clear. So I think, again, you need to see your doctor to establish the diagnosis to verify that you've got psoriasis. You won't need to go and see uh, a, a dermatologist to confirm that you've got psoriasis. And there are different types of psoriasis. The commonest type is plaque, which is what I showed in the earlier picture. But sometimes you can have gotte. Gotte is a drop, it comes from the Latin word for a drop. And that means you get little pinpoint areas of psoriasis around your body. Sometimes you can have inverse psoriasis, which is in the flexures in the neck or in the groin or in the genital area. Postular psoriasis typically affects the hands and feet, the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. And one very rare type of psoriasis is erythrodermic, where you get extensive, almost complete body coverage. And this is a very severe form of psoriasis, which can require hospitalization and can sometimes be associated with other serious complications, including secondary infections. Here are some of the other pictures of psoriasis. And remember, it's important to look for psoriasis in, in the areas where it's often hidden. So in the scalp, at the hairline behind the ears, in the tummy button of the umbilicus, and also I'd like to remind you that a lot of people with psoriasis have nail involvement. About 50% of people with psoriasis will have either nail pits or nail crumbling or anecolysis, which are other very typical features. And here are some of the typical features of psoriasis in the nails. And if you have psoriasis in the nails, it's, it's obviously very cosmetically embarrassing. And it's, it's a, an aspect of psoriasis that patients get very upset about and very frustrated with because understandably it's, it's on show, it's, it's visible and, and, and it's unpleasant. So in regards to management of psoriasis, most patients can be managed with topical treatments, which are creams and lotions and potions. 
but some people require more intensive treatments with phototherapy, which is light therapy, immunosuppressant drugs like methotrexate or cyclosporin or mycophenolate, and occasionally they require biologics to treat their psoriasis as much as they do to treat their axial spondyloarthritis. But I think it's very important to remember that the drugs that we use to treat psoriasis don't necessarily work for axial disease. So we need to select a drug that works across the spectrum that will help both your spinal and your other musculoskeletal manifestations as well as your skin. But that's for us to decide and, and hopefully we are expert at doing so. Sometimes patients are managed in combined clinics where they'll be seen by both a dermatologist and rheumatologist together, or if they're seen separately, we'll put our heads together and discuss your case and decide what the best treatment for you is. For inflammatory bowel disease, as I said already, again, this is about 10% or 1 in 10, but a lot of patients with uh, inflammatory bowel disease might have what we call subclinical disease. So if you examine the bowels of people with axial SBA, who don't necessarily have symptoms, we'll often see low levels of inflammation, which doesn't necessarily cause symptoms. It's only for the patients who have symptoms that really come to the attention of the bowel specialist and require specialist treatment. So if we look at inflammatory bowel disease in detail, in terms of symptoms, most people will present with diarrhea, often mixed with blood or mucus, abdominal pain, needing to open their bowels during the night, They'll often have pain after meals, weight loss, fever, and sometimes ulcers in the mouth or in the back passage. So most patients will have a number of these symptoms. So for example, if you have bloating or tummy pain isolated, it's more likely to be due to other things like gastroesophageal reflux or maybe the effect of your non-steroidals or maybe irritable bowel syndrome. For inflammatory bowel disease, patients are usually very unwell and feeling rather sick to say the least, and they'll have many different features. And then we'll be able to help identify the diagnosis with various tests, blood tests, uh, and sometimes an analysis of your poo, looking for a chemical called calprotectin. If the calprotectin level is very raised, that's strongly suggestive that you might have inflammatory bowel disease. But an important point here is to mention is that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which many of you will be taking for your colitis or for your axial SPA, should I say, can increase your calprotectin level. So a calprotectin level on its own isn't a diagnostic test, but it should advise us to refer you to a gastroenterologist. And the definitive test is an intern examination of your bowel and a biopsy, which we will review under a microscope to make a definitive diagnosis. So when we're looking at patients with axial of inflammatory bowel disease, there are a couple of important points. We need to be very careful to probably avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatories because they can aggravate colitis. And if you've been treated with a biologic, we need to choose one that also works for colitis. So you shouldn't be treated with an IL-17 inhibitor like secukinumab or ixekizumab because they don't work for colitis and might even make it worse. And not all the anti-TNF treatments work for colitis, so we need to choose the right treatment for an individual patient. I'd just like to draw your attention to the NAS Back Pain Plus campaign, meaning back pain plus uveitis, back pain plus psoriasis, back pain plus inflammatory bowel disease, think AXPA. So we're driving this with ophthalmologists, with dermatologists, skin specialists, with gastroenterologists. So if a patient comes to their clinic with newly diagnosed colitis or colitis at any time point, we're encouraging them to ask the patient whether they've got back pain. And if they've got back pain, those patients should be referred through for, to rheumatology just in case they have axial SPA. And this is also represented in the NICE guidance, which is national referral guidance uh, published by the National Institute of Healthcare and Excellence. And this is something that we work towards and, and work with in the UK, both in primary care, in GP uh, territory, and also in the hospital. Just to mention briefly about your targeted therapies, and I'm talking specifically about biological therapies, we have five TNF inhibitors licensed in the UK for axial SPA two IL-17 inhibitors and a new class of drug called JAK inhibitors. The first one to be licensed is a drug called upatacitinib, and this would be available as a tablet. Now, when we're selecting a drug for a patient, we need to think carefully about many aspects of their disease, but specifically these extra articular manifestations. For example, the TNF inhibitor group across a board work across many aspects of the disease. But within the five TNF inhibitors that I've mentioned, you'll see here for colitis, only some of them work for colitis, most of them work for psoriasis, 
but only a few of them actually work for uveitis, namely adalimumab, and to a certain extent, sertralizumab, which is simsia and infliximab. So in summary, extraarticular manifestations are common. They add a layer of complexity to the disease, to the disease burden, and to the management thereof. They can develop at any stage in the course of the disease, so they might necessarily be present when you first develop symptoms of axial SBA. Often they emerge later in the disease course. Patients should be asked about them at every time they visit their doctor. So in rheumatology, we should always ask patients whether they've had any symptoms to suggest they might have any of these complications. But we'd like you to also be kind of aware to bring up any issues you have in relation to your eyes, bowels, or your skin. It's important that we collaborate and work closely with specialists in other departments to give the best long-term management strategy for patients. And it's really important that we work with our colleagues in other departments to encourage them to refer through any patients who have these extra articular manifestations in addition to back pain, just in case they are misdiagnosed or undiagnosed AXPA patients. And obviously, as I said, extra articular manifestations are very important when you're selecting the right biological treatment for an individual patient. So hopefully uh, I've covered that. It's a bit of a fast and furious overview and I'm happy to take questions. So thank you for your time and attention. That's wonderful, Carl. Thank you so much. I'll just go back to gallery view there. That was, yeah, it was a real whistle stop tour and absolutely information packed. Thank you very much. Um, we have had lots of questions coming in. Um, I know you're aware of a few that we'd had before. Um, yeah. I think you've answered a few of those questions already um, just from, from your presentation. Um, but we did have an interesting question to start off from Steve. Um, you mentioned that we know how many people with axial spa tend to get psoriasis, but he wondered, is there any data on how many people with psoriasis who then have axial spa? Yeah, well, there is some data. So certainly for patients who have psoriatic arthritis. So psoriatic arthritis um, means psoriasis plus arthritis of small joints usually. And from what we know, about 40% of those patients have axial involvement, meaning they have involvement of the skeleton. But for patients who have psoriasis, we typically say that about 20% of people with psoriasis will have psoriatic arthritis. And of those, about 40% or half, we'll say, will have axial involvement. So that gives a kind of, if we say the prevalence of psoriasis in the population is about 5%, if we say 20% of those will have psoriatic arthritis, that's about 1%. And of those then about half will have axial involvement. So that's about 0.5%. So that gives you kind of a general population figure. So it's, it's quite common to have axial involvement if you have psoriatic arthritis. And it's certainly an area that's been evaluated further in clinical research recently because it's an, a group of patients for whom the axial element of their disease is often overlooked, if I'm honest. And, and because, you know, patients will come to clinic with, you know, swollen fingers and the difficulty using their hands. And that's often their main problem because it's interfering with the work and, and, and every aspect of daily living. So it's really important that we also ask those patients whether they've got back pain as well. So as I said, for, for spondyl arthritis, there's so many different shapes and sizes, Zoe. Every patient with spondyl arthritis will have a different story will have a different pathway to diagnosis and will have different features at different time points through the disease course. So it's, it's important that every time a patient comes to clinic and every time you come to see your doctor that you bring up all of these perhaps symptoms that you're not really sure how relevant they are, but they might all be relevant to us in terms of deciding on the best treatment and the best treatment pathway for you. Absolutely, yeah. Some things that can seem really unrelated may well be linked in. So yeah, it's really important to let everyone Absolutely. know that. Wonderful. Um, and I think one of the questions beforehand was asking about thickened nails. So I think you went over that um, when you're talking about psoriasis. Um, could you maybe give us a bit more detail on how the nails look if they are thickened from psoriasis? Well, I, th I think I showed a picture. Did I have some pictures earlier? I can't remember. So yeah. the commonest involvement from psoriasis is nail pits which is kind of little dimples or little dips in the, in the nail and you kind of need to look at the nail side on sometimes to see these so they won't always be obvious if you're looking down on the nail but if you look at it from the side you'll often see little dips in the surface of the nail so that's the commonest 
And that's quite mild and most people wouldn't be bothered by that. Um, but then other forms can be quite disfiguring, you know, when you develop crumbling of the nails or you develop new nail formation, things like onycholysis or hyperkeratosis, which is thickening of the nails. That's quite rare, but if it's present, it's, it's, it's really unpleasant and disfiguring and incredibly upsetting. I think if I was a patient and, and I had really extensive nail involvement, I'd be really, really upset by it. And if someone's noticing those changes, is the rheumatologist the best person to speak to you about that? Well, I think in the first instance, if it coincides with the rheumatology appointment, but I think if they're known to have psoriasis, their dermatologist should be their, probably their principal port of call. Okay, excellent. Um, and we've had a few um, questions about um, uveitis as well. And someone yeah. asked if there's any, anything you can do to help kind of prevent a uveitis flare up or ease it at least. Well, nothing you can do to um, to stop it by kind of lifestyle measures or diet or simple things. But many of the drugs that we use will prevent uveitis flares. So immunosuppressant drugs and biological drugs, if they work for uveitis, in other words, if they work as a treatment for uveitis, they will also prevent you from developing flares. So for the TNF inhibitors, we have really good evidence for adalimumab, for sertilizumab and fliximab, not only preventing you getting uveitis, but preventing you having flares if you already have uveitis. So they're really three big ones, they're good ones for uveitis. Oh, that's good to know. I suppose that, that links back to what you said where, you know, your rheumatologist needs to know everything, all the symptoms that you have, because that's going to inform which medication or what treatment. Yeah, it's really important that we choose the right, the right drug for an individual patient. Now, I'm not saying that it's not appropriate to be on another drug. So for example, if you had one episode of uveitis in your lifetime and it was 10 years ago and you haven't had any ep episodes since, it would be reasonable to treat that patient with one of the other drugs if that's considered appropriate for other reasons. But if their uveitis starts flaring, then we would want to consider switching to an alternative. So I'm not saying that you, you can't have, say, one of the other drugs if you got uveitis, but it's probably best that you don't. It's best that you have a drug that actually works for the condition that you've got. But for patients with inflammatory bowel disease, we need to be much more careful because that's potentially much more serious than uveitis. So we really need to be careful that we choose a treatment that works both for the skeleton and for the inflammatory bowel disease. And for anyone who's watching who wants a bit more info on the inflammatory bowel disease and psoriasis as well, I put the links in the video description to um, the NAS website pages on these topics where we've got a bit more info as well. Um, and thank you to everyone who's sending your comments in. I can see out the corner of my eye lots of questions coming in and lots of comments. Saying, I know, sorry, I have no idea what's going on in the background. <laughs> That's all right. You, you get the easier job, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yes, we've got lots of questions coming in and lots of comments saying how helpful it is. So thank you very much, Carl. Um, That's fine. And we do have a question that came in earlier um, about psoriasis, just jumping back again, um, and whether the location of the psoriasis links into kind of any other areas of pain people get. So I know, I think it was Frances commented that she gets problems um, with her Achilles tendon and the plantar fascia on her feet, and then has psoriasis on her feet. Is there any link there? Well, there's no thing published and nothing that I'm aware of to say that there's any geographical association. So, from what I know and what I see in my own practice, I, I don't see any link, Zoe. And there's nothing published to say that there's a link in, in terms of co-localization. So just because you've got involvement of your feet from your axpa, if you've got enthesitis or Achilles problems or whatever, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get your psoriasis there. They seem to be dis uh, they don't seem to be in any way entwined. They're, they're disassociated is, is probably the word. In other words, they, they often occur randomly at different other points. It's just bad luck then, I guess. Good luck, I think, yeah. Uh, Double whammy, I think. Absolutely. Um, and we've had a few questions that aren't strictly about extra-articular manifestations. Are you happy if I ask you those? Yeah, go for it, sure, yeah. I'll take advantage while we've got your expertise. Um, yeah. So someone yesterday asked about if axial spar affects the jaw commonly. Not commonly, but it can do. But it's, it would be very rare. I think if you have jaw pain as part and have axial SPA, it's more likely to do to other reasons, you know, maybe dental problems or maybe osteoarthritis of the 
temporomibular debular joint or maybe a difficulty problems with your bite, or it could be due to a problem with the cartilage in your temporomibular debular joint. It's unlikely to be related to your axial SPA, much more likely to be due to other things. Okay. Um, and we had quite a few questions coming in about rib pain and costochondritis. And obviously we've covered this topic before, so I'll pop the link in those um, comments as well to our previous session on that. Um, the one particular comment that stood out um, was someone asking, if you get persistent pain in the mid part of your back in the spine, is that going to cause any damage or problems with the muscles surrounding there? Well, it shouldn't damage the muscles, but I mean, it could cause damage locally and, and could cause structural damage in the spine and interfere with your rib cage and your ability to expand your lungs and your breathing. So I think it's, it's really important that if you have symptoms in your chest wall or in your thoracic spine that you bring that to the attention of your rheumatologist because that could mean that your disease is poorly controlled and might have an implication for a choice of treatment or a change of treatment if, if your treatment isn't working well. So in patients who've got those type of symptoms, I'll often repeat their imaging, say they're already on a biological treatment. And if I find they've got inflammation ongoing despite their treatment, I'll may switch into a different treatment. Okay, that's good to know. Um, and sticking on the topic of muscles, would you be able to just explain briefly tendonitis and how axial spar can cause pain in the tendons around the muscles? Yeah, so basically tendons collect, connect muscles to bone. And tendons have a sheath, which is a covering, uh, which we call synovium, which is the same covering and the same material that's within your joints. And if you get inflammation in a tendon or in a tendon sheath, that will cause pain and swelling at the point of attachment of the muscle to the bone. So that's why you get pain in your Achilles or in your plantar fascia or sometimes in your elbow. And, and, and they're very common um, associations. We, we have a technical term for this, we call it enthesitis. Anything in it that ends with the word itis means inflammation. So enthesitis is inflammation of the enthesis and the enthesis is the point of attachment of ligaments or tendons to bone. But when you've got enthesitis, because that's affecting the tendon, you'll often feel the pain in the associated muscle which connects to the tendon. So sometimes people with enthesitis they may not just have pinpoint pain at the point of attachment. The pain may be higher up, say, in the muscle in the calf or in their forearm or, or elsewhere uh, because that's connected to the tendon. That's, that's really good to explain because often we do get questions on our helpline about different areas of pain and whether it's linked to axial spar and, and yeah, just yeah. understanding the various different areas that it can affect, unfortunately. Unfortunately, it can affect practically every area. Absolutely. Um, and we did have a question specifically about some scan results as well. I don't know if you're able to answer this. Um, someone was asking about having reactive edema in their mid back on their thoracic spine on a scan. I don't know if there's anything you can do to enlighten us on that, but it's something they need to talk to their rheumatologist about. Well, people with axial SBA typically have inflammation in their sacroiliac joints. And we recognize inflammation on a scan as bone marrow edema. That's the kind of visual appearance of inflammation. Now I'd have to say there are other causes of bone marrow edema. So for example, an injury or an accident, or if you've just had a baby, or if you've just gone out and done a 10K run, all of those things can cause edema that can mimic inflammation. But for people with axpa, about 40% or 50% will have inflammation in their spine as well. And the commonest site of inflammation in the spine is actually the thoracic spine. We don't know why, you kind of think it should be in the lumbar spine, i.e. the lower back, because that's where people often feel pain. But actually on imaging, it's usually in the thoracic spine. And, and, and so on the thoracic spine, we'll see edema, typically in the corner of the vertebra. So the vertebra are the big bones in your back. And in the corners, that's where the ligaments attach. So that's kind of enthesitis of the spine. And that's very common in people with axial SBA. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know whether I've answered your question, but... Hopefully. I think that does. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm throwing some curveballs at you, so I really appreciate it. No, no, um, fine, so it's fine. I think we've covered most of the questions that came in um, before the session. Um, and there are a few really specific questions. Um, so I will go back through all the, the comments and just make sure that we've covered everything. Um, yeah. The person has asked about specifically um, being on adalimumab for six weeks and not notice any improvement. Um, are they going to need different medications or, um, 
or should the bylaw be too early to say? I think six weeks is still too early to say. I mean, I, you really would need to wait for three months at least, and sometimes up to six months to see the maximum benefit. So don't despair. That's what I would say at six weeks. Um, you know, give it to three months before you get start to get a little bit worried. And I think if at three months there's been absolutely no response, um, there's a couple of things to think about. Number one is to be absolutely sure that your pain is due to AXPA because people with AXPA can have pain for other reasons. Um, secondly, be absolutely certain that you have AXPA and not another cause for back pain. It would be very unusual for somebody to have no response. But if you had genuinely no response and your consultant's you know, confident that the diagnosis is correct and that the reason for your pain is AXPA, then it's a good reason to justify switching to a different treatment. About 10% of people don't respond to the first treatment, okay. the first biological treatment. And, um, and slightly related to that, someone's asked, they, they're on their final biologic now, and, they're, and um, I think they said that they're going, you know, they're not finding it helpful. Um, and they're wondering if there are any new medications on the horizon. Well, I think there are lots of, when somebody says final, that always makes me a bit depressed because I, I never think that there's a final medication because there are always other medications. So don't despair. That is not, the, the idea that this is the end of the line is not necessarily true. So we have, as on my list, we've got five TNF inhibitors, two L7 inhibitors, one JAK inhibitor, which are these new tablet, uh, really, really potent anti-inflammatory medications. Um, but there are other JAK inhibitors in development. Two others are likely to come to market next year. There's another IL-17 ANF inhibitor called bimekizumab. And there are another group of drugs called TIC2 inhibitors, which are in development. So there are lots of new things coming to the market and will be coming to you know, a, a hospital near you in the near future, as in over the next five to 10 years. But drug development takes 10 years at least. So, you know, the, it, it takes time, but there are, there are new, thing, new drugs coming to the market year on year. So don't despair. Things are looking good for AXPA. Absolutely. That's really exciting to hear. And, and imagine for everyone watching, that's really encouraging as well, hearing that there's so much going on in terms of research and, and medication development. Yeah, big time. It's, it's brilliant. When you think 20 years ago, we had nothing really other than, you know, obviously analgesia, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, uh, exercise, which for many people is, is, is sufficient and, and adequate, but for 50% of people, it's not enough. But now we have, uh, you know, a, an exponential rise in new therapies. It's, it's magnificent. It's really the future is promising. Sorry? The future is promising. A bright future ahead, Zoe. It definitely is. <laughs> yeah. um, that's wonderful. So I think we have covered pretty much all the questions there. Um, and as I said, I'll go back through the comments and make sure that we've covered everything and, and add some more links and further reading as well. So thank you so much, Carl. Really appreciate your time today and just that wealth of knowledge as well. It was wonderful to cover so many different areas. No problem, so it's been a pleasure. And uh, I can't see everyone or give you a wave anyway. So thanks for joining and hope you enjoyed it. Absolutely. I think it's one of our most watched sessions so far as well. So thank you. Um, oh, that's good. That's good. And for everyone, so I'm going to have to peel off because I've got someone waiting to see me. So I'll just say goodbye to you now too. Lovely. Thanks very much. And uh, see yeah, you next time. You. Take care. Bye. And so for everyone watching, um, our next session is going to be in a couple of weeks on Tuesday, the 27th of July at 1 p.m. I'll be, I'll be joined by Dr. Lindsay Cherry, who will be discussing foot problems and foot pain and how they can be linked to axial spa. She'll also be answering all your questions. So look out for the adverts for that session. And please do pop your questions in the comments on those posts so that I can ask Dr. Cherry all of your questions. So thank you for watching. Thank you so much for all your comments and getting involved. I hope it's been really helpful today. Take care, everyone, and hopefully see you next time.